Uh, right now, uh, uh, over to we just have one panel today. It's uh, uh, Lord Greenhouse, I say, the Minister of State for Building Safety and Communities, who's a particular responsibility for uh, the cladding and relate, uh, related building safety issues. Um, uh, Minister, uh, you, you're welcome once again to the committee. Um, I, I, thank you very much for coming this afternoon. I think you brought one of your officials with you. So if you could introduce uh, your official at the beginning, that would be helpful as well. Yes, uh, thank you, Chair. Um, the official is Richard Goodman, who's the Director General um, responsible for building safety and also um, the zero carbon agenda. Right, thank you very much. And uh, uh, Richard uh, Goodman is welcome uh, as well. Uh, I think essentially, Minister, we'll probably uh, ask you the questions. And if you want to bring your official in to help with any particular answers, that would be, uh, you know, that was, that's absolutely fine. Okay. Um, can we just begin then having a look at the uh, ACM cladding, the sort of uh, uh, cladding that was uh, used uh, on the, the Grenfell Tower block that uh, uh, had that terrible tragedy uh, nearly four years ago uh, when so many people lost their lives uh, and were so uh, badly affected, others uh, and their families, uh, by, by that? Um, you, uh, the government have said uh, recently that 95% uh, of all high-rise buildings with ACM cladding um, have either remediated, been remediated or the, the work is on site currently uh, and 100 percent of social housing has either been had the cladding taken off or work is on site. Um, another way of looking at it is that uh, four years, nearly four years after the Grenfell disaster, uh, half of the buildings with ACM cladding still haven't had that cladding removed. Is that a satisfactory situation? Well, let's um, recognise that um, it is um, it is 95% where, uh, for those buildings recognised at the beginning of the year where work is underway or the, or the cladding has been removed. Of course, we'd like to see things go, go faster, but let's recognise that we, we've been in the middle of a, a national emergency and a national pandemic. And with a lot of progress being driven through pressure, uh, enforcement action, We've seen 159 of those ACM buildings um, start on site in the last year, in 2020. And that compares very favourably with the previous year, where only 90 started on site. So we've seen essentially an acceleration in the progress to remediate those very buildings that have the same cladding as on Grenfell Tower. Right. But I suppose if we, we, we look back, we can see that the previous Secretary of State said that uh, they expected um, that uh, all ACNM cladding would be removed by June 2020. Now, I appreciate that commitment was made uh, pre-pandemic, uh, but then uh, in response to a previous report of this committee, um, you know, the government said uh, they expected to uh, have works on site for removal of all unsafe cladding by the end of 2020, and that hasn't happened either. Uh, and, you know, that, that commitment was made in the middle of the pandemic, so it was pretty well known. So ca can we be really confident now uh, that all this cladding will be off during the course of this year? Well, uh, just to go back, I think you pressed me on this point, Chair, in one of my many appearances before this committee. I think I've had three in less than a year as a, as a minister. And I think you, I came up with a, the ambition to get 100% on-site or remediated. And we've, we've hit close to that. We didn't quite get there, but it was an ambition. It wasn't a commitment. Um, what I can say to the committee is that um, we are tracking every single one of these buildings extremely carefully. And uh, so far, um, our estimates are that we'll be at around 87% of buildings um, uh, that will um, have completed the remediation in total. Um, and probably closer to 95% by quarter one next year. So we won't have, but obviously that's improving with every month that goes by, but currently we're not on track to have remediated every single building, but we'll be at around the 90% mark. Is that satisfactory? Well, uh, we'd love to um, go further, but it's not just a matter for MHCLG. It is working closely with um, other levels of government. So in London, we've seen an acceleration because of we uh, we had a building safety summit. We've had um, joint inspection teams step in. We work closely with local government. And any advice that the committee can give on how we can move quicker, of course, we'll take that on board. But this is these are hard yards. Right. Is it time to name and shame those organisations which aren't getting on with it? 
we did um, name and shame. We've named every single building owner that hasn't got on with um, with uh, remediating ACM cladding, and we'll continue to point those people up moving too slowly. Has the government got any power to compel them? Should it have powers to compel them? Well, I mean, clearly uh, there are powers that are vested in fire and rescue services. They so have the Article 30, or 30 and 31 prohibition notices, but that, that does mean uh, decanting residents if they're in those buildings. Um, and that, so there's, that's, these are powers that shouldn't be taken lightly, but there are powers available um, through um, you know, local housing, housing act and through fire and rescue services, because obviously the, the responsibility to, to keep a building safe rests with a building owner and those powers do exist. Yeah. But I suppose that's a punishment to the to the occupiers. Yeah, Correct. On, on the other hand, it could cost the building owners a lot of money if people had to be rehoused for any period of time. That's 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 correct. Yeah. So we are um, we have, um, for instance, issued 18 improvement notices, eight hazard awareness notices, five prohibition orders in the course of getting as far as we've got. And we will continue to um, to use those sanctions where, where we need to. So, you know, formal. Enforcement is part of the armamentarium and, and it has been for around 58 of the buildings in the ACM bracket. Right. In terms of the, the, the money to get this ACM cladding off, um, I understand from the latest figures from the department that out of the 600 million, only 160 million pounds has been allocated. Why is that? Oh, sorry. Can you repeat that, that, those figures again? Uh, the, 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 uh, of the uh, of the money uh, for the uh, uh, sorry for, for the AC, this is sorry for, this is for non ACM cladding. Uh, um, the, the, my, my mistake. Uh, uh, we just moved on slightly there. The, the, the ACM cladding was a six hundred million pound fund, wasn't it? Then they yeah. had the a billion pounds for um, uh, non ACM cladding, which has then been subsequently added to. There's a billion pound there announced in the budget last year. Um, Two thousand eight hundred twenty registrations for it, but only one hundred 60 million out of the 1 billion pounds yet being allocated is there any reason why it's been so slow well um we 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 we, rec we recognize with the existing applications that we will have committed the initial 1 billion um and I, we, that we were warned of that um uh, in, um you know some months ago um and so we're on track to do that there has been um some issue around the quality of the information provided so um in some cases um, we've had uh, no basic information. Well, not in some cases, there are over a thousand applications. There's no basic information to assess eligibility. And on a further 200, 332 buildings, 12% inf insufficient information to assess eligibility. So one of the breaks on being able to um, put the funding agreements in place has been uh, not having enough information or no basic information at all in the vast, in over a thousand. But there's still time for that information to be submitted now because the, the, the funds gone up in size. Yes, correct. Yeah. Well, the funds gone up in size. So it's not a funding issue, um, but we do need to know that the, these right. buildings do have unsafe cladding. Right. Um, so uh, on, when the billion pound fund was announced, it was a, basically a first come first serve. But now you just indicated that the funding is not an issue. Uh, it's about having a proper bid put in. So there's three and a half billion pounds there. Does the department yet know absolutely and for certain? how many buildings 18 meters or above have dangerous non-acm cladding um now we've got some estimates but perhaps i should bring in um richard precisely on the latest estimates that we have as a, as a whole as a department richard yeah thanks minister um so we published as part of the bill impact assessment uh, an estimate of 15 percent of buildings over 18 meters plus having some form of facade issue which would need remediation uh it's worth the committee knowing that we continue to look at those data sources and we're looking at uh, uh, uh other surveys but those are based on the uh on the actuals um on the building safety fund we've had just under 3,000 applications in total. Um, as the Minister said, uh, the best part of 1,500 of those have either had no information in uh, or have had insufficient information for us to build an assessment. So um, we're not yet in a position for me to be able to give you clarity about how many applications transfer into, uh, if you like, work which needs doing off the basis of decent information because many of those uh, applications have been um, it's sufficiently detailed for us to reach, uh, reach beyond. So that's where we are on validating that estimate. I think that's helpful. I think we can all appreciate the, the, the difficulties in trying to um, get more precision in both the numbers of buildings and how much work may be uh, needed uh, to be done on them. 
what happens if that estimate of the number of buildings and the likely work uh, is uh, greater uh, or supposed to be greater than the, the current figures you have in mind? Um, does that mean the three and a half billion pounds then would be extended because it isn't a first come first served, but doing all the work necessary? Uh, it, so if, if the figures go up when you find the actual uh, requirement to remove non-NCM cladding, uh, will extra money be found? Well, Chair, I mean, as you know, as part of the announcement that the Secretary of State made, um, we are looking for the development industry to make a contribution through a tax and a levy. Um, yes. And of course, that will go towards the, um, you know, the taxpayer commitment that now is in excess of five billion. But I'm sure, should there be a, a bit more money needed, then there's a scope to have those negotiations with Treasury to ensure that we, we keep our commitments. So, so essentially, it, it, you'll do what it takes to get this non-ACM cladding off. I think we've made the commitment now as a government. We do what yeah. it takes. Yeah. yeah. OK, that, that's really helpful. Right. Uh, looking at the, the slightly uh, uh, lower buildings that aren't covered by the actual uh, funding scheme. Um, Rachel Hopkins. Rachel. Chair. Um, so the government, the government has estimated that there's about uh, those residential buildings, sorry, between 11 metres and 18 metres. Um, in height, there's approximately 76,000 of them. Um, and the Secretary of State in his statement on the 10th of February said, the remediation of cladding is less likely to be needed. In many cases, it will not be needed at all, but where it is, costs can still be significant for leaseholders. So what is the government's assessment of how many of these buildings require remediation of cladding? Um, again, um, I think we, we, we probably don't hold as, uh, obviously the numbers of buildings between 11 to 18 metres is considerably greater, as you mentioned, uh, 76,000. We don't have, we haven't started any, any funding of, um, or, or we haven't issued the funds. So I'm not sure we have as, as, as detailed uh, data in the extent to which um, remediation will be required in those buildings. But we made obviously that commitment that where it is required that leaseholders will not have to pay more than um, uh, uh, 50 pounds a month. Um, what I what I have is some further data around um, the number of residents that fall within that brackets and the number of dwellings, but not specifically, uh, and the numbers that are freed from EWS one requirements. But then, it, but that doesn't really answer your specific question. So I'm afraid I can't. can't tell yeah, you. I, th I think what I was getting at is, don't you need to know this data? You know, isn't it essential that you have this data in order to de determine what your policy options are? Well, I mean, we um, we we, uh, we 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 do need, we did we we only know through the building safety fund uh, the, the the numbers for a, for a lesser amount, and we we clearly do need to know. Uh, we do well need we and we've made a commitment to ensure that people do not do not pay vast sums of money to re radiate cladding, but we don't know um, the precise numbers. And I, but I think you know. I don't think there's any, anything more I can say on that. OK, let me try another way then. So can you uh, tell us how? Well, you want, you want to ask, Rich, Rich, I mean, perhaps um, my official might be able to give you more than data than I have, if there are any any data on the numbers that are within that bracket. So just let, let's see if we have any more. OK, yeah, particularly used to formulate yeah, the policy. Yeah. So um, you're correct in saying there are about 76,000 buildings between uh, 11 to 18 metres. So on the basis of the policy, the evidence that we've had from... The surveys we've done so far um, which has been supplied to us partially through the private sector so we've got a contract with an expert architectural practice um, who give us information about what they've seen in terms of where building owners are doing the right thing and remediating this themselves the sorts of issues that they've come across and the type of costs that they might um, generate and also looked at the prevalence of cladding through a series of site surveys which is work which is under being undergone right now to improve the position of those numbers but the starting position as Lord Greenhouse described is that uh, we assume the prevalence of cladding uh, broadly to be on a conservative basis to be uh, analogous in 11 to 18 metre buildings as it is for 18 metre buildings and above but the likelihood for remediation to be lower uh, and it's just worth spending a moment to explain why that is and some of the focus on height. Uh, fundamentally, it's about the ability to exit a building uh, in time, as well as the nature of, uh, of the cladding. So the likelihood of needing to do remediation work on the cladding itself gets lower as you come down 
uh, in height, whereas in a higher building, you're much more likely to need to remove the cladding in its entirety or in a very significant part. Um, thank you for a little bit more clarity on that. So was it solely height of the buildings that, that helped you make this decision or were there other considerations about why, you know, that distinction between above 18 metres and below 18 metres? You know, was it solely height? Was there anything else that surely had to come into making that policy decision? Well, we do recognise that height is a major factor because all the independent expert advice has shown that height, um, as well as use, uh, um, residential buildings at height, we know that those between 18 and 30 metres are, are four times more likely to have a fire related fatality or um, needing or having an individual needing requiring hospital treatment and if you look above 18 meters that rises to 35 times more likely so height is clearly a, a key determinant um, and also um, the ability to come up with um, proportionate and different forms of remediation in medium rise but, but this, um, buildings becomes more of an option um, so we encourage all building owners to carry out obviously and have an updated um, fire risk assessment and that will then provide the advice needed on, on how to make sure a building is made safe. Okay, thank you. Um, so with the introduction of the new policies, can you give an outline of the assessment you've made of when every building above 11 metres, which was within the scope of the government loans or the direct funding, will be fully remediated of dangerous cladding? Sorry, just, are you asking? So, yes, so you've, you've made some of these policy decisions, um, and so obviously what assessment has been made of when every building above 11 metres within the scope of your loans or the direct funding will be fully remediated of any dangerous cladding? At the moment, I don't think we've got um, um, that. We can't make that precise assessment of when those buildings will have been remediated. And what we're providing is a financing facility to ensure that those, 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 those works can progress. And so I'm not sure we got to the stage where we can say all those buildings will have been remediated by then, because clearly we're not approaching these medium rises with, a, with the same policy approach. It's, it's not um, directly grant funded by, by the taxpayer. We're, you know, we're looking at a different approach. But so I can't I, that commitment. I'd hope that you would have had uh, human safety at the forefront of all of these policy making decisions with the mind's eye that as soon as practicable, um, so I find it quite surprising that you haven't even got, a, you know, an, an idea of a rough estimate, give or take, you know, things that happen along the way of when all buildings will be remediated. That, could, you know, open ended then, is it? No, um, I, I've just, uh, I mean, clearly uh, we know that with the, with the high, we're focusing on the high rises, the reason I've given you, and we know that um, those buildings are being assessed and funding um, has been granted to them and more will be granted. Um, and um, those and the first tranche of wave of those go on site in September um, and the, lo the loan scheme is to is to follow but I don't want to give you dates that I can't give at the moment for a start we haven't published the details of the loan scheme and how that's going to operate so I'm not in a position to give you any more um, time scales. So would you want some of this further work's been done be in a better position to give us a clearer understanding of when they will all be um, remediated? Well when we know more about um, but not beyond the the, the, the uh, industry estimates of the both the prevalence and the absolute number that require um, remediation, then we'll be in a position to give give more information to the committee. But at this stage, I can't you know, make up uh, something on the hoof when we don't when we don't simply don't have the information. So it's so it's a it's a don't know answer. To you don't know at this stage. No. I don't know. You don't know when they'll all be safe. Okay. I don't um, know. We don't know. We don't know enough about this. You know, we've got some assumptions which you've heard from my my official, but we can't extrapolate from that when all the buildings will be made safe. No, we, we can't make that uh, commitment at this time. Okay, but but can we press you to try and give us your best um, extrapolation as soon as possible? Because this is the concern of so many of us and so many of our constituents. And I know I've spoken yeah. to people um, in this difficult position. So um, just a final point from me. Um, we heard in an evidence session last week from more than one witness um, that given the number of affected buildings, and the lack of capacity in the construction industry, a sensible estimate of when this work will be completed was at least 10 years. What, do you agree with that? Well, um, what I would say is that we are working directly with the supply chain to 
uh, anticipate and mitigate delivery risks. We haven't come across those significant supply constraints that your witnesses have provided. Um, we are trying to ensure that, um, that there's a high level pipeline of required work with contractors across England. Um, we are engaging with the industry very closely to increase the availability of the installers needed to carry out the remediation. Uh, and we haven't seen the capacity constraints that you've described so far. Okay, so two differences of opinion, but thank you for answering my questions. Okay, and obviously it's not just cladding uh, that uh, can affect building safety, but there are other issues as well, and Bob Blackman is going to explore those with you, Minister. Bob. Uh, yeah, thank you, Clive, and uh, thank you, Minister, for the answers you've given to us so far. Uh, now, clearly, as Clive has quite rightly said, um, there are a number of concerns other than cladding, uh, namely fire safety in buildings. And at the moment, as we understand it, the government hasn't taken any, a any action yet on... Um, ensuring that the safety concerns and safety defects um, that are identified are put right, um, particularly as we're in a position whereby many buildings have yet to be surveyed. I mean, is that a fair um, summary of the position? Well, well, I would say that you're right, that we've made a choice to focus on what we consider to be the greatest um, risk to life safety, and that is the, you know, the, the, the cladding system. So we know that it is the cladding, um, and in particular, aluminium composite material um, spreading up the side of a building, particularly a high rise, that yeah. provides the greatest life safety risk. That accelerates the spread of fire. Many of the things you're talking about, the cavity barriers, the internal compartmentation, the fire breaks, they're designed to stop the spread of fire. So you're right that the so far, um, the um, approach has been to focus on the area that provides the greatest life safety risk. We recognise there are other um, non, non cladding um, safety issues uh, that need to be that, 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 that um, need to be um, looked into as well. And what I would say is that the commitment from the government does include um, uh, uh, cavity barriers and also balconies where they form part of the external. Um, cladding system. So where the cladding system involves those elements, then that will also be remediated. So, so just to be clear, so that we are we are clear, because there are, I think there's some some things circulating that suggest this isn't the case. The unsafe balconies and such like, which are on the obviously on the uh, walls of the the uh, buildings, are covered by the the scheme to remediate the cladding. That is, that is correct. Um, oh, okay. All those associated costs, such as fire cavity barriers, where they are integral to the cladding replacement. Okay, so not the internals, but the externals are, are, are what we're uh, talking about funding. Because oh. I think there has been genuine concern, yep. and I, I, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I think there has been genuine concern that some of these areas have been excluded, and there's a genuine concern, I think, amongst many leaseholders that they're that they're not going to get that that funded and they will have to pay for it so i just want to be i want complete clarity for for the record if well, i can i mean anything that's required in order to remediate an unsafe cladding system and i've given the example of um the associated costs so the fire cavity barriers that are integral to the cladding system but also balconies where they're integral to the cladding system all of that will be covered by our funding and our funding perspectives does make this clear bob so okay no i don't I, I'm, I'm i'm i just want to make clear because i've heard different people making different claims i just want to make sure you know we don't have um, uh incorrect information floating around which are, doesn't help anyone but but uh, just moving on to the other fire safety defects armor uh, in their evidence uh, to us last week uh, said they'd surveyed more than 400 buildings above the 18 metres in height uh, and estimated that the cost to fix the non-cladding defects was roughly the same or maybe even greater uh, than the cost of fixing the cladding. Um, now, that, that's got to be paid for somehow. Does that, does that concern you, that the estimates of the building so far are so high? Well, I mean, it is concerning that we're seeing the scale of uh, the, a problem like this. Um, and I have, I ha I have had uh, a meeting with Armour, so I'm aware of their estimates. Um, and um, and it, 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 you know, it's, it's, it's helpful to know, um, you know, to get their perspective. And, I'm, and we need to have that, that understanding. But what I would equally say is that um, 
given uh, you know, the, 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 the scale of the issue, we've chosen as a government to focus on the element that, that is actually the greatest contributor to, to life safety risk. And we've got to recognize that there's no way you can make the argument that a missing cavity barrier or um, uh, you know, missing, um, not having the proper internal compartmentation in any way could po possibly been in line with building regulations at any stage, at any time, mm. uh, quite clearly down to shoddy workmanship. And what, what I would say is that, uh, you know, there must be, in many cases, uh, the ability to get redress uh, from, uh, the, from the people that carried out those works in such a poor manner. Yeah. Uh, uh, has the government made any assessment yet? I mean, obviously, Armour have, have, have well, given us their view. Um, have, have, have the government yet made any assessment of the number of buildings which have, have got serious fire safety defects? Um, well, actually, yes, there, there is a, a, a data pack and the, pers and the official with the, the greatest grip on the exact data is, of course, Richard, Richard Gooden. Yeah. Richard has to come in. <laughs> And, um, and, and, and also, I need to know which numbers I can release and which I can't. So over to Richard to provide you with the statistical... <laughs> well, so we, uh, uh, thank you, Minister. We've, we've, um, we obviously published an impact uh, uh, assessment with the draft safety bill about looking at prevalence of those other defects, um, which, which gives estimates of those, who, for example, 3% on compartmentation in the 80 metre plus stock for instance. Um, just coming back to your uh, earlier question about the need to remediate some of those fire safety defects, I think it's important to draw a distinction between two things. So the cost of remediating a defect is not necessarily the same as cost, uh, the cost of making uh, a building safe or putting in place the relevant measures to be able to um, uh, ensure the building passes its fire risk assessment. So for instance, um, uh, if you're looking at, uh, for example, uh, a compartmentation approach, the answer may not be to remediate the defect to the level that it would be needed under the building regulations today. There may be alternative measures which would be appropriate, for example, um, uh, a different exit pathway from a building rather than necessarily intrusive work uh, in order to fix the original defect. Uh, 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 and that is why... Um, the premium on fire risk assessments is so important because that gives you a view about the actual risk in the building from a fire safety professional who can look at everything in the round and look at the things which are most important to be remediated from a, a risk-based uh, proportionate view uh, as opposed to, for instance, looking at the building regulations as they currently stand uh, and identifying every uh, defect with the building, which is an approach which it will be familiar to everyone, for example, from having surveys done on structural problems, which anyone who's bought a home will be familiar with, um, that structural defects may or may not need remediation um, in order for, the, for you to have confidence in, in the building's overall structural integrity. Yes, but uh, just, just, just taking this um, further, the, the issue then is was the building built as as uh, Lord Greenhouse has, 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 has stated quite rightly, if the building was built in line with existing um, regulations at the time, then clearly the developer owner can quite rightly point and say, well, we built it in line with those regulations. New re latest regulations may have changed and they changed the goalposts. So the new buildings will of course be in line with those regulations. And if they're not, they clearly have to be uh, remediated uh, because they would be wrong. Um, the issue then becomes of if remediation is required, so if remediation is required uh, to fix fire safety defects, where, uh, who has to do it and at whose cost? Um, and the clear concern is at the moment, the poor sucker in the middle is the leaseholder because they're the only ones that uh, are the ones that say, well, hang, I've got this flat. Um, there's got fire safety defects. The building owner or well, the building developer has disappeared, um, never to be seen again. The owner says, well, we can't afford to do it. Um, or if we do do it, we're going to pass the cost on to you. That is the clear concern that is being exercised, I think, by leaseholders right now up and down the country. And what we're, clear, what we're keen to do is to establish what the government's view is on what happens in those cases. So can you shed any light on what the position will be in when a fire safety assessment is made on a building which requires remediation 
I accept completely there may be a risk assessment that says actually you, know, you don't need to do anything there there it's not it's not in, in accordance with current regulations fine but where a fire assessment takes place that says you need to do something how is that going to be funded and what action is the government going to be taking to make sure that the building owners carry out that work well i think I, my, my initial response to you um before richard came in was uh that clearly the lack of these um these these the the the, the, the issues that are non-cladding related very often it's down to shoddy workmanship and there should be a form yep. of replace and the responsibility rests with the the owner of the building um to deal with those safety issues and i think what um um you know what's been stated off by, by, by my official is that often the remediation plan um is um the proportionate and sensible approach to mitigate risk and it's often not necessarily dealing with the inherent structural de defect but finding a workaround um in order to ensure you you you, you minimize that any life safety risk i'll give you an example i mean there, there, there's one building that's mentioned in a um in a in a one of my cladding q and a's that i have with cladding groups where uh, there's no um, issue with the external walls with external cladding um, that was um, perfectly in line with regulations, but there were there was an issue with internal or lack of internal compartmentation, and the architect on the um, Q and A was pointing out that yes, if you went ahead and you stripped the cladding to then deal with the internal compartmentation, you probably would get a bill at around a hundred thousand per leaseholder, but it makes absolutely no sense. Uh, to go and do that, um, there are might, maybe more proportionate approaches, um, ret refitting a sprinkler system or dealing with other um, um, mitigations that would not mean that you would pay that anything like that quantum to deal with it because of the nightmare of being able to do that particular kind of work. Um, so I do think um, you know what what we encourage um, um, you know building owners to do who are responsible for um, for these um, historic fire safety issues is to get an up to date fire risk assessment on the measures that they should carry out to sort the problem out. That's the that's what we would advise. OK, I mean, last September, the government said that it accepted that more safety issues will be identified and addressed in buildings, uh, meaning that residents will be safer. But there are potential for one off costs to leaseholders. And that is why one point six million billion was provided for mediation of the most high risk buildings where uh, the likelihood of value affecting and expensive remediation work is far greater. So the issue then comes of the fire safety issues, where work has to be carried out. Clearly that affects the value of a property. And, and I can point you to properties now uh, uh, in my constituency even, um, where work is required and it affects the value of the property. Um, and it's not just the cladding, but it's it's the other remediation after a fire assessment has taken place does that does the government accept that there's a need not necessary for for, for paying for this I, I i just want to be clear uh, i'm not necessarily pursuing the idea that, that the taxpayer pays this but for government intervention to force the position whereby those responsible actually either pay for the work to be done or carry out the work themselves I, I think the government and but government at all levels can play a part in making sure that the developers that put up those buildings that allow people to skimp on you know, basic fire safety and, and structural safety issues like a lack of internal compartmentation, they have a duty to stump up because there's just no excuse for that sort of shoddy workmanship. Uh, and finally, for me, I think Ian may want to come in on, on some supplementaries here. Um, there are issues that have emerged during the inquiry. Um, of materials being used in buildings which do not conform to the, the, um, to the safety uh, tests. Um, there are allegations, I'll put it no further than that, that some suppliers have, have cheated on the, on the fire safety tests. Under those circumstances, what action is the government going to take to, against those responsible? Well, I just find some of the uh, findings around um, the product manufacturers, the product, cladding products and installation manufacturers, absolutely mind boggling. And um, it's one of the reasons why we've created um, uh, a, a new oversight for construction products that's now housed within the, um, the OPSS. The, um, so that's the Office of Product Safety and the other S eludes me, but that, um, that is within phase. 
Um, and um, and it is important, and also why the testing regime has been, frankly, abused, as you as you described. Yeah, yeah. And that's why the Secretary of State announced last month a, a short expert review of product testing, because it's quite clear we need root and branch reform and better oversight. But what's more, uh, and this isn't government policy, and as a minister, I shouldn't make it up on the hoof, but frankly, a lot of these manufacturers have made very healthy profits, these cladding, and, then, and they should be made to be, um, you know, Putting their, um, you know, making their contribution to what is an enormous cost that at the moment is falling uh, largely on the on the on the lease, on the leaseholder, and sometimes you know there are great build, there are building owners that are stepping up and doing the right things or yeah. getting mediation, but also unfortunately on leaseholders. And we, I think it's time for those um, for those cladding manufacturers to make their contribution to, to funding this. Uh, to this, I mean, clearly the position is on going forward with new buildings. The, the the standards are, are going to be set out and if, indeed the testing regime will be set out. The concern will be about materials that have been used in existing buildings that are substandard and need to be replaced because as a fire assessment is carried out, undoubtedly there will be recommendations to retrofit uh, proper materials. The issue then is what action the government will take against those individuals or those firms that have provided the substandard materials. Um, can you shed any light on what the position will be? Because there'll be thousands, if not millions of people across the country thinking now, what, what, what's gonna happen when, when a fire assessment is carried out on my building? Am I gonna get landed with a huge bill as a result of uh, people's shoddy workmanship or deliberate um, mistreatment of the position? Well, first of all, the new, um building safety regime is not just for the new builds it's also for anything that's deemed to be within the high risk category so anything within scope and uh, and i'd expect the new chief inspector of, of buildings um to step in uh, to ensure that we do pursue those those av avenues risk um you know uh, rigorously uh, and then my officials will also you know work with other, all layers of government to ensure that the people that um have carried out that shoddy workmanship um uh, you know that we we, we support um the, the measures that are taken by building owners to get proper redress so it doesn't fall on 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 uh, leaseholders richard i don't know if you want to come in i i mean i think it's worth saying that we have obviously expanded the secretary of state's announced expansion of the scope of the existing regulator who will have powers to take on uh, existing products uh, as lord greenhouse says the safety case regime under the building safety regulator will in turn uh, look at the risk of a, a, a of a building. It is, of course, uh, unknowable in a sense without doing that risk assessment yeah. work, what the risk is. Uh, but what we can say is that going back to the answer I gave earlier, there's been an awful lot of survey work done and a lot of assessment through the Building Safety Fund to look at those um, uh, individual cases and to assess the nature of the cladding uh, there. The broader testing regime is obviously something which will need to be picked up uh, uh, as part of that review. Okay, thank you very much. I'll leave it there, Clive. Okay, I think Ian Burns got a supplementary on the on this issue. Ian, thanks, Jay. Just a, just a quick one, uh, Minister. The British Standards Institution has withdrawn its new guidance on fire risk assessments after the bereaved Grenfell family threatened legal action, saying it ignored critical inquiry recommendations relating to people with disabilities. The local government's association is also under pressure to withdraw its fire safety guidance, which is used by local authorities. So what is your department going to do to replace this guidance? And when will you issue the promised consultation on personal emergency evacuation plans? Well, to, to, to be clear, the, um, the, uh, I think you're referring to um, the, the measures that are form part of the fire safety consultation that involves um, personal emergency evacuation plans and uh, that consultation is closed but we did um, have to um, reconsult over um, PEEPs in order to get that right which as you say is a very important part of the um, inquiry and um, we'll be publishing um, that shortly and it's also um, contingent because it will be the underpinning for the regulations of the new fire safety bill um, for that to come into effect um, so that um, you know that's due to return to to the Lord's next week i think the fire safety bill and um and it's going through the ping pong measures but the regulations would then follow some months afterwards that would put that all into place so just a, a quick follow-up on that chair uh, 
you're saying ping pong follow up with months uh, that further down the line, maybe a few months. What's going to be placed to void now of guidance to local authorities? Well, we have an existing um, fire safety order 2005. So this was to to clarify the remit and to consult on some of their inquiry recommendations. Um, and um, but I think the consultation response and will be published before then. But some of that requires legislation, and that legislation held up because it's going backwards and forwards between the Commons and the Lords. Okay. All right. Thanks, Minister. Thanks, Chair. Okay. Uh, we'll move on now to another important part of the government's recent announcement was the uh, the loan scheme for the um, properties immediately under 80 metres. So Florence, I shall allow me to pursue questions on that. Florence. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Minister. So we know that over the last three years, ministers have repeatedly claimed that leaseholders should not be forced to pay any of the remediation costs. And by looking at proposing and introducing a loan scheme, we could see leaseholders being charged in effect around £600 a year. And for a number of leaseholders who, a number of them haven't received any funding during the last year, a number of them paying from waking watches, do you not think that these additional payments would just be another betrayal of that promise? Well, let's recognise that the government has announced a globally, and I and emphasise that, a globally unprecedented amount of money uh, towards uh, the funding uh, of these um, historic building safety defects. And it's a number that when I first came in was only 600 million, then there was a billion announced last year to take it up to 1.6 billion. This takes the amount of money that we're putting towards um, remediation of unsafe cladding at five point, over 5 billion, and the, um, the loan scheme will be heavily subsidised. Uh, and um, we haven't yet got an estimate of the total cost of that, but it will be considerable to, to uh, you know, considerable taxpayer support. And we must remember that many of these taxpayers that are providing or have contributed to this funding are people that could never um, have the opportunity of owning their own home. So it is tough, but we face an, an eye-watering bill to deal with historic building defects. And we've tried to put that money towards those buildings that uh, present the greatest life safety risk. And that's understandable, the greatest life safety risk in terms of 18 metres. But you said that the height threshold because of the increase of 18 metres, but actually if we look at the fact that remedial works are still being required in buildings under 18 metres. So again, you know, coming back to that cost, which leaseholders are having to pick up through no fault of their own, you know, should the government be looking at providing additional funding wherever leaseholders are being forced, because they are being forced to take out a loan, being forced to pay these additional charges? Well, what I would say is that, uh, and the Secretary of State made this very clear, I think when this was first announced in the House, that the the, 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 this financing scheme is not um, uh, with the individual leaseholder. It doesn't affect their credit rating. It's held at the building level, and it's ensuring that the contribution by a resident leaseholder is no more than fifty pounds a month. And um, you know, of course, it's a contribution, but it's um, it's a small contribution of what will be the likely co total cost of remediation. Um, so, and it makes sure that uh, there's no upfront cost requiring. A, a, you know, what would be worse is if they required this remediation, and there was no loan scheme in place no financing scheme, and then they faced a large upfront cost with only 28 days to pay it. So this is a way of ensuring that it is affordable to those leaseholders in medium rise buildings where, where um, the remediation of unsafe cladding is required. Again, just to come back on that £50 a month cost, I hope you'll appreciate, Minister, for a number of leaseholders, I represent an inner London constituency in Vauxhall, that additional £50 will make or break a number of people. It may seem like a small figure, for, but for people who've not received any funding, people who've lost their jobs, people through no fault of their own are trying to find money every month to pay increased insurance costs, wake and watch costs. £50 a month is a lot of money to be asking people to pay. Just coming back to some of the um, issues around that, um, one of the things that we've been looking at is around what assessment the government have actually made. So you highlighted that the, the loan wouldn't and the assessment wouldn't be on the buildings. Um, but has there been any assessment on the property values for if leaseholders have to take out one of these loans? You know, surely there'll be some issues with the valuation and it could decrease if there's a loan attached. Well, um, I'll, I'll bring in uh, my official, but the, 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 many of these um, leaseholders in buildings where, um, where we've seen values drop to zero. And so the remediation is part of 
ensuring that the value in their properties returns um, because you know it's the way of ensuring that they are both safe but then the property asset returns to its uh, its um, its previous value um, but Richard perhaps you could come in on specific assessments around the loan scheme uh, happy to minister it's worth um uh, it's worth the committee knowing that we've set this into the context of, uh, 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 as you pointed out, the existing costs which leaseholders are having to pay. So, for example, the average waking watch uh, payment could be in the region of uh, 180-odd pounds. Um, and in that context, this remediation, although, of course, I recognise that the £50 pounds is, is an imposition on that leaseholder, would represent a net saving against the cost often of some of the interim measures uh, which individuals are having to pay. Um, the other impact of the £50, pounds which we've looked at, is the certainty which it gives leaseholders, but also lenders, about the overall nature of the liability that they might be facing. So, uh, obviously, at the moment, as um, Mr Blackman was describing earlier, the potential range of bills which a leaseholder could face could be very, very varied from quite a small bill to fix a small defect into tens of thousands of pounds for a large one. Um, the importance of the cap is not just on the uh, overall value, although, of course, £50 will be a lot of money to an awful lot of people. Um, but, as the Minister said, is less than the upfront cost, but also allows a lender to price in with some certainty what the overall impact on the property value might be and the overall impact on the affordability assessment uh, for somebody who's seeking a mortgage. Uh, and the effect of that, which we saw recognised by some of the lenders um, uh, at the point at which the Secretary of State made the announcement, is, is designed to inject certainty back into the market and to allow people to buy and sell their homes again and allow the market to function more broadly. Um, so the £50 is about the individual leaseholder, but it's also about the broader effect on the market uh, and helping the industry bring some of the prices um, that, that you were describing back down into a more sensible and proportionate um, set of outgoings for, for the leaseholders who were affected. Thank you. So just to clarify on that, Richard, so consultations have been taking place with the regulators and, and the lending banks in terms of the scheme of the valuation to current existing mortgages on those affected buildings? So, um, uh, I can point you to perhaps some of the press releases. So, say, for example, Barclays and, and Nationwide, both of whom recognise this as being a decisive step forward uh, for the market in terms of it being easier uh, for lenders to be able to price what the potential impact of a property would be. So, I don't want to, I don't want to speak for the lenders, but I'm using their statements that they put out at the time you made that uh, that announcement. I just want to ask, has there been a loan ass impact assessment for the loan scheme and how this would be conducted, given the lack of data you've both highlighted um, for buildings below 18 metres? Well, I think um, what, what Richard was, was stating is that um, uh, we avoid the any upfront cost which would be have a worse impact on leaseholders and we're and it's also um obviously the the works that are required to ensure that there there are no further interim safety costs or waking watch costs um so this will be considerably less than those costs um to date so you know we can you know just from the armchair work out that this is a better deal for those leaseholders that where cladding does need to be removed on those buildings than um that than um, not stepping in at all so we know uh, we know that it's that, you know this is a, a better outcome than that. Um, of course, you know the outcome that uh, I know many on this committee would would be asking the taxpayer to do is to is to front all the costs at, at irrespective of height. Um, but you know there's a there's an you know we are we are we are where we are and we've made the choice around um, uh, prioritising those buildings that present the greatest life safety risk and removing those materials that accelerate the spread of um, fire in those high rises. And we're providing a scheme here to support those those um, leaseholders that, that will have to uh, undertake re uh, remediation in the medium rises with this loan scheme. Great, thank you, Minister. So I'll take that as no, there wasn't a, uh, an impact assessment. Just wanted to know, did Michael Wade propose any additional solutions to the government? I mean, Mike, Mike, Michael was uh, focused on, on who pays. Um, and uh, and one of the things they looked at was a financing scheme, um, and and obviously this is one of the proposals that we've taken forward. So I don't think there's, um, I think we've we've taken the broad thrust of his work, and 
apply that to the solution that's that, that's before you. Great, thank you, thank you, Chair. I'll leave it there. Okay, thanks, Lawrence. And uh, um, Bob Lackman wants to come in with a, a supplementary on this, Bob. Yeah, yeah, it's just a very brief supplementary because um, I'm not sure if you're going to be able to answer this at the moment. Uh, when the Secretary of State made the announcement of this scheme, he stated that the details will be released uh, by the Chancellor in the budget. Um, I, I may have missed something, but I didn't see any announcements of the details of this scheme. Uh, and so I just wonder when the when the full details will be available, because I'm still at a loss personally to understand how it's going to be calculated, what leaseholders are going to be asked, actually asked to, to contribute. The Secretary of State said no more than £50, but he hoped that it'd be considerably less, uh, possibly as low as £20 a month. Um, but it's not clear the basis of this scheme. And I just wonder when the details will be made available so that we can scrutinise it and indeed leaseholders can have a look at it. Well, and it's a very fair um, follow-up question. I don't think it was the Secretary of State that made that commitment, but it, it, I, I believe that one of the ministers did 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 indicate that it would be um, in the budget. And, they, and your eagle eyes have not missed uh, uh, any <laughs> any of the details in the budget. But it's fair to say that um, it's something that um, a joint team, and that's a joint team of officials within MHCLG and also Treasury, are working on. And those details will be be uh, you know. Um, in short order, but I, I can't say any more than that. But it was never intended that they'd be published at the budget, and it wasn't something that Secretary of State. Uh, Secretary uh, are Committee you did. able to give us any idea of the timescale of, of, of because well, I we, think a lot of people we, we, will be we, we, waiting to see this I mean, detail. I, what I say is that I'm, you know, I'm, I'm seeing, I'm, I, I'm being asked to comment on early stage submissions, so we are working this up. It's, it's a, a very live project, but I can't give you a specific date by when it will be ready. Um, although I'm being shown something. Um, soon, I'm being shown, which soon. is no more than what I said, you know. But I mean, it's we are. It is. At least you didn't say the spring, because um, we'd be saying, no, oh, that that extends to November. Um, I'm using. Uh, I'm getting used to Whitehall and the seasons <laughs> extending. But that's why I don't want to give you a specific day. But okay. there's, there's nothing more important than sorting out the details of this. Uh, so, so, but, but very importantly, from from our perspective, um, the scheme is still being worked on. So, um, uh, the principles you've you've established, but but not the detail. And that will be released in due right. course. Correct. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Right. Uh, right, Minister. But although the, the, you, you haven't got all the details ready yet, um, government have been very clear that leaseholders will not have to pay. The, the loan will the, the loan will not be a, a charge against individual properties, individual That's leaseholders. Right. It'll be payment. on the building. So it'll be on That's the freeholder. Right. That's that, now. That's, there, there are the building level. Yeah. Yeah. So there are legal contracts in place currently with the freeholder having the right to pass. Um, you know the, the costs of repairs through a service charge onto leaseholders. Are the government going to cut across that current legal uh, uh, right for, for freeholders uh, and uh, legislate so that they can't pass these costs onto leaseholders? Well, I, again, um, I don't want to. Um, I don't want to. Uh, um, I don't want to preempt that. But we're aware there are existing ways that, that the building owner can pass on these costs. Um, but we'll do what it takes to ensure that we we land our policy intention, which is that the the right. scheme is it caps costs at no more than fifty pounds. Hey, Richard, if you want to say any more about that, because clearly we're taking legal advice on these matters, and we are aware of the existing service charge arrangements. Yes, I just I just wanted to um, uh, uh, make the point, Chair, that we recognise the the different nature of existing leasehold arrangements. Um, uh, which span the different types of buildings which could be uh, affected. And part of the work we're doing in building up the details of the scheme is how to ensure that the loan attaches on a, on a per building pay basis and to a leasehold rather than to a leaseholder, for instance, or back through the service charge uh, regime as a, as a potential mechanism. But we recognise the complexity of the landscape that you've just described. Right. So this is a work in progress and hope you can um, solve it. Right. OK. What happens then when a freeholder, quite, some of them are quite small companies who bought the property simply to get a ground rent out of it, weren't involved in the initial development at all. And that freeholder says, wait a minute, I'm getting my ground rent. The ground rent doesn't cover anything like the cost of this uh, loan the government's going to ask me to pay back. I'm walking away. Dissolve my company. Leave it. What are you going to do then? Well, I'm not, we're not asking the... Um... The, the building owner to make a contribution towards the remediation costs. We're, it's, it's a taxpayer subsidised loan scheme that ensures that the excess costs are borne by the taxpayer. Wait a minute. So it's a loan 
on the building, who's paying the loan off? Well, I, I mean, Richard, my again, the details haven't been published, but my my understanding is that it's not um, what you're saying is that we we is we we loan the, the amount of money that's required to at the building level, so it doesn't fall on the leaseholder. Uh, we ensure the leaseholder doesn't make more than a fifty pound contribution. We aren't saying that the remaining amount then is it falls entirely on a freeholder, as you say, that might have a very limited equity interest in the building, because that may be result in then. They're not, you know, not being the, the, right. the front required to carry it out. Um, so my, my understanding so, is it's a subsidised loan, you know, it's with a cap on what the leaseholders contribute. So at the rate leaseholders are, are paying, then it could be many, many years and decades before the loans are paid off. Well, it's a long term loan, but the works get paid up front, obviously. Right. Uh, I, I can see why you're still working out the details. <laughs> Uh, it seems a, quite a, a challenging scheme, but no doubt we'll get more information on that in due course. But in the end, it isn't the freeholder that's going to be responsible for paying this loan. It isn't. Um, it isn't falling on the freeholder. It's in, and it's ensuring that the costs don't uh, and don't uh, exceed fifty pounds a month to the leaseholder. But is is the debt? Who is the debt with then, as a legal entity? Well, I, again, I, the underpinning. I'm talking about detail that, which hasn't yet been published, but um, unless. Um, Richard, how about you? You want to step in? Uh, that's the, but my understanding is that the, it's at the building level and ensuring that no more than fifty pounds gets passed on, and but the who, government is providing that loan facility. Yeah, but who is the legal entity that holds the loan? Well, again, so, that needs to be published. But I'm, assu I'm assuming it's the building owner that holds the entity at the building. Well, that's level. the freeholder. So the freeholder is then responsible for the loan. So. Uh, uh, to come back to what the minister was describing in terms of the, the, the functioning, we will set out details of how the financing scheme will work. What we've published so far, though, is the parameters in which we are working. So as the Secretary of State said, the plan is to be a loan on a, on a to a building basis. That's because we want the work to, uh, to happen. And so therefore, it needs to look at the building as a whole. Obviously, we need to work through the mechanism through which, for example, leaseholders are engaged in being able to make that decision. Uh, as you were saying, Chair, the nature of leaseholds can be very variable depending on the type of building that you work in, uh, that, that you uh, that you are operating in. Uh, and so for some leaseholders, that may be a straightforward operation and for others, it will be less straightforward. So one of the issues that will need to be worked through there is the legal framework, which will apply to the nature of a loan in order to meet the other parameter, which is capping the liability of an individual leaseholding to Fifty pounds uh, per month. Those are the details that we're working through at the moment. Uh, there are various different options that could be pursued in terms of creating a scheme within those parameters, um, and and that's what the department will need to publish in due course when we, we've set out which of those options it will right. will work. Well. So, so at this stage, th there isn't any certainty about where the legal liability for the loan will rest. There are different options about how that liability structure could operate, right. um, which we will be testing in order to, as uh, 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 it was previously probing, in order to ensure that we understand the impact of that fully. I think before. it's going to be a very big issue to, if leaseholders want reassuring about where their obligations are and aren't in this matter. But um, we're going to have more details from you in due course, and maybe we'll want to explore those further at that time. Okay. Right. The issue of waking watches has been mentioned on a number of occasions. Uh, Andrew Lure. Andrew wants to explore that. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Chair. Uh, waking watches. Um, uh, Minister, you are tasked by the Secretary of State to undertake a review of the ongoing costs of waking watches. And we've now got some data on this. And that data estimates that the relief fund will impact a maximum of uh, 26,680 leaseholders. Um, what help is there for the other leaseholders uh, who in London are paying a, a, a mean average monthly waking watch cost per dwelling of £499? Well, um, we, we recognise that the bulk of the funding, so the, um, the £5.1 odd billion pounds, um, is focused on uh, the measures that will mean that uh, interim measures such as waking watch um, uh, or any other uh, interim measures are no longer required. So that's that's uh, where our focus is to make sure that goes ahead. Um, this 30 million pounds um, does support uh, a significant number of buildings 
to install um, a, a, a simultaneous evacuation alarm system. Um, and that's what the National Fire Chiefs Council rec recognises a more sensible way of approaching interim measures. And it'll support that in anywhere between 300 and 460 odd buildings. Um, so that's a chunk of the building. And, you know, you know, clearly at the moment, there's no additional funding that has been made available because that's the focus is on um, providing the support needed, the many billions needed to remove unsafe cladding. Okay, well, in terms of this, as you say, uh, it covers um, the 30 million will cover the installation of alarms for 300 and four, between 300 and 460 buildings. Yep. Um, but there are 590 high rise buildings in, in London alone, so it, it doesn't even cost that. So are you anticipating more funding coming? Well, at the moment, that's the extent of the funding that we've committed. But we recognise in in London that that figures. I mean, it's more than half the fund is allocated to London because it's been done on a proportionate basis. So that's some sixteen million pounds. And so within that estimate, um, we'd estimate in excess of two hundred buildings of that amount um, uh, would be would be funded. Two hundred to two hundred and forty odd buildings would be funded um, uh, through this um, th through this through this particular fund. So that goes some way, and then hopefully in other buildings, it'll be the pace of remediation and the funding of the cladding itself, which obviates the need to have a, a 24 hour waking watch at all. So, you know, it's a combination of the two things that will hopefully um, make a dent in ensuring that leaseholders don't continue to pay really very extortionate costs around waking watch. And one of the things that we carried out um, and which I requested was uh, to shine a spotlight on the um, levels um, of uh, of cost, and it showed that there's great disparity in what um, what leaseholders were paying, and uh, and we've got some published data now that hopefully will help people challenge where they've got um, costs that look ridiculously high, um, because it is an area where some of the procurement around this has not been a first rate. Okay, so UK CAG welcome that fund because they recognise those sort of impacts that you've just been describing and. I'm, I'm hearing from you um, that, that there are plans to do, to do more if necessary. So uh, I'll take that as an encouraging sign. Well, we, we, we recognise the most important thing is to is that these re intermittent measures are a bridge um, re that's required uh, until we until we get these buildings safe. So the most important thing is to have the funds in place that enable the the, the cladding to be remediated, and then these measures are not required at all. And of course, we recognise the 30 million goes some way, but not all the way. Um, but that's what's in place at the moment. Thank you. Okay. Uh, what, one of the other issues Ms., that's been uh, raised as a concern for leaseholders, of course, is the uh, cost of insurance that's been rising rapidly uh, in many cases. Oh. And Brendan Clark Smith's going to pursue that issue. Brendan. Thank you, Chair, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, Minister, last September, in its, its response to our report on cladding remediation, the government said when they were uh, publishing the draft for the Building Safety Bill that um, it had made clear it intends to address the insurance issues related to building safety and uh, including consideration of some of the challenges for high-rise residential buildings and what they're experiencing in terms of obtaining affordable building insurance cover. Uh, have you... Um, how have you addressed the building insurance issues since last September? Well, um, this is uh, something that is of considerable concern. And I, I first of all, and my officials have um, recognised, um, well, there's only three ways that you could approach a problem like this. And the first, um, and they get increasingly more difficult. So the first thing that you can do with, with uh, the you know, high, high levels of building insurance is see whether there can be a market-based intervention. Um, and uh, we're aware of um, that there, is, there, there are moves afoot in the industry to look at um, some market-based solutions to um, building insurance um, that we're obviously encouraging. Um, and the British uh, Insurance Brokers Association have been looking at a market intervention. That's one thing. Now, that may not be enough. Um, and then the next tranche of interventions that we can look at are forms of indirect intervention i mean we need to recognize that actually the the number of claims um that have been made um for um high rise um for fires in high rise um buildings has been reducing quite a bit um so it's surprising to see this sometimes up to a thousand pound thousand percent increase against the background where the volume of claims is going down 
But so we're looking at uh, making the moral arguments, um, holding roundtables. So I'm holding a roundtable uh, later this week with um, the ABI, Bieber, um, and also with the cladding groups in attendance to make the moral case for, you know, if the volume of claims is going down, why is um, building insurance going up? Um, we also note that, and I certainly had this feedback um, with cladding groups, that buildings that are um, kind of owned in isolation sometimes seem to have um, have the biggest increases, whereas buildings that form part of a group um, have lower insurance levels because it, the insurance risk is pooled. And so we're, you know, we're seeing whether there can be, we can encourage the market because there's a very strong reinsurance market to see whether there can be pooling of insurance uh, as well as a way of bringing down costs. Um, but the last um, option open to government, uh, if the market intervention indirect prods don't work, is to step in and um, bear some of the risk. But then the issue for the taxpayer, again, is when you in intervene in a marketplace, um, it's easy to step in, but then it's it's not so easy necessarily to step back out again. Um, but all of these things, um, you know, we're keeping uh, an eye on. But certainly what we are doing is pushing um, um, the, um, the the various people that are involved with the market um, to take um, a very much more proportionate approach to risk and, and explaining themselves about why we're seeing some of these hikes. Yeah, thank you. Um, and le leading on from what, what you just said there, Minister, um, Armour, they uh, conducted a survey of 143 of their, their members' buildings, and it showed the average annual uh, premium increase per block for uh, 2021 was 374%. Um, and 10% of the 143 blocks had increases in excess of 1,000%, and the highest increase provided was 1,840%. Um, following on from what you say would you say then that the that's evidence that the market isn't actually working and um on, on top of that just just another side point um i wonder if you could comment on and um, in terms of some of the requirements from insurers um where where the london fire brigade have perhaps been satisfied that waking watches aren't needed but then insurers have still uh, requested them um is is that acceptable or is, is there something we can do about that well i, I have heard uh, examples of that from the cladding groups that uh, you know the, the, the fire uh, service steps in the LFB for instance in London has stepped in and said you do not require a waking watch but then it seems like their insurance company has had a, a different view but we need to recognize and that's why we need to sit down with the insurers and make make these these points that they take a, a proportionate approach uh, to risk um, and it seems to me that you know in, in, we, there seem to be examples where that's not necessarily being followed. Thank you. And, and just um, finally, another, another proposal that um, Armour made to um, MHCLG, um, whereby any, any increase uh, to building insurance premiums would be much lower in exchange for the government um, accepting the risk on, on fire-related losses in excess of uh, £250,000, which I think you, you touched on. Uh, do you think this is a way forward, or, or what do you suggest is the alternative if, if this isn't taken up? Um, would it be non-insured non buildings? Well, at the moment, we've got very few examples of buildings that are completely without insurance. Um, there are some difficult buildings um, where um, getting cover has, is, is proving problematic, but they're isolated numbers. What I suggested to you is that we need to pursue um, market-based solutions first and also indirect intervention uh, before we consider um, the more direct uh, Sort of solution that's um, that's been proposed by by Armour because then again that that is again a you know even by Armour's own calculations is tens of millions of pounds worth of taxpayer um, uh, um, support for 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 uh, so we need to just check whether we can get to the same place through more indirect and market based solutions in the first instance. Okay, thank you, Minister. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Brendan. Uh, right, just move on to the uh, issue of the uh, the levy and the tax that was announced in the statement as well. Ben Everett, Ben, you want to explore those? Thank you very much, Clive. Um, and thank you, Minister. My ears pricked up earlier when you uh, you referred to uh, the, the, the profits made in the um, the construction development sector um, uh, for, throughout the uh, the course of the last few years, and indeed uh, this year has been no different. Um, Last year, this committee said that the funding should, um, uh, the funding of re remediation should reflect where the blame lies. And of course, we've, we've noted that proposal for the, the government has to bring in the levy, um, which would uh, um, hopefully 
bring in uh, over two billion over ten years. Um, so, given the, the likely costs we have heard of, uh, of remediating all the buildings is going to come into uh, probably about fifteen billion. Should we not have set that a bit higher? Well, um, we need to recognise um, that um, that the sources of funding from the developer community. And you're right. I mean, my my information is that the margins have increased pre-pandemic somewhat um, from around 13 percent before tax to closer to 20 percent um, from the volume developers. And it's right that they and that they, they contribute to that to this. Um, and, and yes, the um, the tax, the developer tax is proposed is to raise two billion over 10 years. But in addition, um, Secretary of State announced the Gateway Two levy, which would be part of the new building safety regime. So that will then that's an in addition, and that's for new high rises um, before construction. That there's a contribution, so that would be further money. But then we also need to recognise that we are putting considerable pressure on um, on the developer community to go further. Um, there have been public announcements now by a number of the developers um, who are setting aside significant amounts in addition to the developer tax and the proposed. Gateway Two levy, so I think it's uh, Taylor Wimpy have committed 175 uh, million pounds, um, Persimmon 75 uh, 75 million pounds in in that order, um, and others have committed uh, also significant, many tens of millions. So we, we're looking also from that route. And I also mentioned that although this isn't yet policy, that we should also seek contributions from um, the product manufacturers, the very products that were put on on on, on Grenfell. And have been used inappropriately where product testing has been gained. So, you know, there's an opportunity, I think, for to develop policy to raise further funds. So I don't think you can come with one silver bullet or windfall tax, um, because quite honestly, in a global environment with global markets, um, you know, you won't necessarily collect any of it. All you do is shut down an industry. So we do need new homes, we do need to get the balance right, and we are seeking a number of routes to get the contribution from the people that have uh, played a significant part in the crisis that we're facing. I think that I mean that all sounds sensible to me. There's obviously there's no one silver bullet and there's no one way of uh, of of solving this because if there was we would have done it. <laughs> and that's and that's the, the the nature of this problem is that is that it's complicated. You bring up Taylor Wimpy there, and of course it's it's great that uh, that, that they've announced their 125 million uh, remediation fund. Um, but I guess the point that is being made certainly by some of the the respondents that we've had is that you know, tell. The, the pre-pandemic slump in profits um, has meant that, say, a Taylor Wimpy have only made um, 264 million in in 2020. Now, of course, um, that's that's leading to an annual dividend of 151 million, which is 21, uh, which is 25 million less than the uh, the, the, the um, uh, amount that they put, or sorry, more than the amount that they put aside uh, for remediation. So. You, you can see where the optics are on this, that, that, that there is an argument that there's a bit more in the pot um, to, uh, to, to be um, exploited from the, the government side. Do take your point that we don't want to scare the developers off. We do want to build more houses. Uh, but do you not think that there's a bit more that the government can do to, to, to squeeze a little bit of more capital out there to solve this problem and then move on um, from, from a safer baseline? Well, I think the... Um... First of all, I got my figures wrong. You're right. It's, I think I said 175, but I didn't want to scare the Taylor, Taylor Wimpy um, PLC. That, uh, that I, I think they'd be bounced by that. <laughs> it was 125 million, absolutely. But in addition, you need to recognise, I think that's on top of the 40 million that they committed towards ACM remediation. So it wasn't far off the, 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 in its totality. I think we just got to continue to push developers to do the right thing as we remediate the non-ACM buildings, um, encouraging them to step forward where, um, where, where, where they've um, put up buildings with unsafe cladding to, to, to remediate the, uh, those amounts um, in, the, in the high rises, to deal with the, um, the shoddy workmanship. So, you know, we've been asked about uh, how that can be funded. I think it, it's those developers that are responsible for buildings that have both the cladding defects and non-cladding um, building safety defects that they step up and pay more. And that's that that will be in addition to the levy and the tax that I've outlined. I mean, you could always set it higher. It's a judgment, um, but it's a judgment where we need to recognize the, the, the important role that developers play in, in building the homes of the future. And we do need more, more housing, um, but they have a responsibility also to contribute to resolving um, this cladding crisis. Yeah, agreed. And the... <laughs> The, the point that you made in the, in the answer to my first question about not um, you know, making sure that we do get these homes built, 
Um, the new tax on uh, on profits in uh, in the residential property development uh, sector will that be a pure tax on profit on new builds? Again, um, again on that um, on the developer tax, uh, I can't give you unfortunately more details than that the Treasury is working with um, my department on um, on the specifics of the developer tax, but that's I think on looking at, at a tax on profits as opposed to a levy in order to build. Uh, and that you know that so that's you know my understanding and, the, and that group's been established and more more details will be announced on that so I can't really preempt that. Thank you and I, I guess you've kind of answered, answered my follow-up already which would be are we not worried that the costs are going to get passed down to either leaseholders or new buyers or you know we constantly throughout this inquiry we've worried and, and questioned and probed about the, the passing on of costs to the folk that live in the buildings. Um, is, is this something that uh, you can give us some degree of certainty that is being dealt with um, during the policy making process for, for these two new ways of, of retrieving some of the revenue? Well, uh, in large part, um, the reason why we had this unprecedented amount of money committed uh, towards the remediation of unsafe cladding, so over 5 billion, is to precisely do that. To do that. It's to cushion this not falling on the shoulders of leaseholders wherever possible, recognizing that, you know, they are victims in this, uh, they bought their buildings in good faith. Yeah. And we're stepping forward and remediating that, dating that entirely at the taxpayer's expense in high rises. We're capping the exposure to 50 pounds in medium rises. And we, then we've got to push down and bear down on the developers that are responsible for uh, those defects to um, also step in where, 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 where possible to minimize that eventuality, because we don't want that falling on leaseholders um, and, you know, that's why we're doing what we're doing, essentially. And also with the those leaseholders in the social sector, it's important to say that one of the provisos of the fund is, you know, where uh, a, a social landlord is, is intending to bill a leaseholder for the remediation of um, uh, of a, a cladding system, um, the funds are open to those uh, to those to those social landlords um, to apply um, to, to avoid that happening. It's there to protect the leaseholders. That's the purpose of the government intervention. Absolutely, and I'm, I'm sure that any, anybody listening into this would, uh, would, would would be well on side. You mentioned that the the, the purpose was pushed down onto the uh, the developers um, to make sure that they take the responsibility. Um, it's industry wide, though. There's there's there are more players in this uh, complex problem than the developers that bear some responsibility. Are we confident that we're um, make, making sure that the net is cast wide and that yeah. nobody's getting away without? Um, without shouldering some of the burden of taking responsibility yeah. to, for making it right. Well, um, you're right. Um, but what I, I, I've spent enough time now in this job to know that um, the developers have actually done very well out of this. And we mentioned the um, profit estimates and you've quoted some figures as well. Um, we also know that um, the people in the construction of these buildings um, uh, often are operating on uh, wafer thin margins. Um, so, you know, we're talking about one, two, three percent. They're cash flow businesses. But equally, um, the um, my officials use uh, a practice to get data on margins. They do know that some of the construction product manufacturers are making very healthy profits too. And whilst they're not within the net at the moment, they're potentially an area where we could spread the net wider to make a contribution to what is an eye watering sum of money in order to pay for all of this. I think spreading the net wider would definitely be uh, be more helpful. And I think just before I, I hand back to our chairman, we should do one of those kind of BBC style disclaimers that uh, uh, not all developers are bad. Not everybody in the industry uh, bears bear some responsibility, although there is there are plenty of people that do. And of course, um, the, the minister mentioned Taylor Wimpy there. There are definitely other developers who've, uh, who, who've made profits and uh, um, 125 million pounds of remediation fund put aside it is very, very welcome. So with all those disclaimers, I will hand back to, uh, to Clive. Thank you very much, Minister. Thanks, thanks, Ben. I'm sure we want to follow some of those issues up uh, about product manufacturers in due course as well. Uh, uh, now, uh, on to EWS1 forms uh, and issues around that. Mary Robinson. Mary. Thank you, Chair. Um, Lord Greenhalgh, I just want to explore the effect of all of this on the wider housing market. The Secretary of State said in his statement that he expected the interventions, including on EWS1 forms, to provide confidence to lenders, which he said would restore effective lending, purchasing and selling of properties as soon as, as possible. Our witnesses last week didn't recognise that this issue was resolved and suggested that the negative impact is already being felt by the 
housing market. Do you agree with that assessment? Well, um, I think um, we recognise, um, specifically with EWS1, um, there hasn't necessarily been a proportionate approach to risk. And that's why we issued the clarification to the consolidated advice note um, that was first issued in 2020. Um, it's also why um, uh, RICs, um, who um, provide the guidance that's used by valuers, started their consultation at the back end of last year, and that closed. And then the results of that have been announced and published today, in fact. Uh, and what that does now, you know, all of those moves effectively take close to half a million leaseholders um, in, in these buildings not requiring an EWS1. So that goes a significant way to um, ensuring that, um, you know, the, the, the EWS1 is used uh, in those buildings where there's where, where it's required and not, I mean, we've got some ridiculous examples of thatched cottages re suddenly requiring EWS1. Um, there are, um, and, and the RICS guidance is very, very clear that um, buildings under four storeys, um, you know, really shouldn't be requiring EW, EWS1 at all. Um, those buildings um, between four and six storeys, it's where the majority of the facade is covered in an external wall system may require an EWS1 in that instance, uh, or if they have um, some of the uh, volatile cladding systems that are uh, similar to Grenfell or the same as Grenfell, then, then it may be required in the medium rises, but a large number will not. Uh, and therefore, you know, we're, we're, we're very, and, then, and it's certainly the message today uh, from the banks has been uh, very encouraging that they feel that provides a framework for their valuers uh, and certainty for the market. Thank you. So uh, has the government got an estimate then of how many householders, uh, homeowners have been uh, impacted by these issues, with, particularly on, with regard to EWS1 forms? I think um, specific, I mean, I, I mentioned the figure of um, it, if it impacts positively close to half a million, but um, I think it's probably for Richard um, to come in and give you the detail on the specific numbers. So there are around uh, 1.27 uh, million leasehold flats in buildings <clears throat> above 11 metres. As the Minister says, we estimate about half a million of those will be taken out of the scope of the EWS1 uh, process um, uh, overall. Uh, I, I think it's worth saying on this front that that, that sort of sets the uh, a reduced scope for the number of people who need an EWS uh, one form. Uh, the guidance itself is also designed by RICS to be clearer uh, than some of the existing guidance was, which we know injected uh, a degree of uncertainty uh, in, into the process. Um, this intervention is designed to give a more proportionate risk-based um, uh, uh, and clearer guidance framework back into uh, the market, uh, which should introduce some stability uh, and clarity on that front. Uh, as the Minister says, it's been welcomed so far um, by the lenders. Uh, it is, of course, a EWS1 is, of course, a lending process rather than a government-led process. Um, it's worth saying as well that we've also uh, recognised the challenges that people have had in terms of getting an EWS1 assessment where that is uh, required by the lender uh, and have been working with RICS um, to put money into a training scheme for 2,000 assessors uh, in order to increase the ease of getting an EWS1 form where it's where it's required. So it's a case of both narrowing the scope uh, as well as making the process itself easier to navigate. Yeah, I think that's, that's a very important point. It's both uh, reducing the demand and requirement for an EWS1, but then increasing the supply uh, for those professionals that then can carry out the assessment in a timely manner. Thank you very much for, for that um, detail. Um, so for the half a million uh, people who uh, are taken out of it, that, that's good news. But it does still leave almost 800,000 who would be in need of this form and, and still goes to the whole question of the detriment that could be felt by them and uh, the wider housing market. Um, is the Ministry, therefore, responsible for making an assessment on the wider impact of this issue and wider cladding issues on the housing market? And if not, who is? Well, I, I think the, um, the first thing is that um, you mentioned that the quantum of leaseholders that may, be, may require an EWS1, but that's obviously uh, the number of buildings that are in scope um, is cons considerably less than the hundreds of thousands that you required because you only need one EWS form for the building then. And there's actually a portal where these um, EWS1 assessments can then be 
um, made available so that uh, once it's been carried out once you don't repeat the process unnecessarily um, and um, you know I think it's important that um, that we work with um, the professional institutions to ensure that there's a I think the role of the government is ensure that we encourage a proportionate approach to risk uh, and that we don't see some of the things that we've seen um, up to now where uh, you know, an EWS1 requirement seems wholly illogical um, and something that just merely um, um, provide was a barrier to someone being able to, 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 to sell or move on um, and you know this is good news and we, we're looking forward and we've had very positive reactions from the lenders that um, where they are required there are going to be the professionals that can carry that out very very quickly and they should just be a formality in many many cases. With regard to the wider impact on the um, on the housing market is this uh, is this a, an issue that your department should be making an assessment of or does it lie elsewhere? I think we, we have um, uh, made an assessment in the sense that we have a plan and there are three elements to the plan we've had. one is uh, working with the uh, insurers and the and and encouraging the lenders to be proportionate to risk and reducing the demand and working with Rick's who carried out this consultation Secretary State and I've had many meetings with the leadership of Rick's about this but it's obviously their consultation and their findings it's absolutely right that it's professionally led the second thing is that we we step up and again fund the scheme to increase supply and the third element is there has been some issues around um, professional indemnity insurance being available to some of the people that carry out the EWS1 um, survey and stepping in and ensuring that they do have access to the professional indemnity insurance so it's essentially uh, the assessment is yes there is a problem and the approach has been to restrict demand increase supply and ensure insurance cover so that these work these um, important reports where needed can be carried out thank you sir um and still the media reported in the last month that more than a million homeowners have been left unable to sell or remortgage and tens of thousands of sales have already fallen, thought to have fallen through. Are those figures that you recognise? Well, um, they are figures that I recognise having been um, put into the, to the media. Um, I, I'm not sure, um, Richard, you, you may want to comment on um, the specifics. I think they some some of these figures around that talk about millions, maybe somewhat um, of an overestimate. Do you want to come in with our, our view on on, on this? Uh, thanks, Minister. So certainly the estimates of millions uh, uh, don't align with our estimates about the overall size of the market, which is I described as around 1.3 million resale dwellings in total in buildings uh, 11 metres plus uh, or beyond. In terms of individual lending decisions and lending data. Um, that's the responsibility of the, the, the banks who uh, own that overall uh, market study. Um, the Minister pointed to the reaction of some of the lenders to the announcement we've made. Um, it is worth um, uh, pausing briefly just beyond the EWS1 process. Of course, the root cause of uh, the anxiety in the market was the um, uh, uh, it, it is the anxiety about the need to remediate itself. Uh, and just to come back to the earlier um, uh, uh, questions of the committee. The important thing is uh, obviously to get a fire risk as uh, assessment to put that issue to bed and, and provide certainty for these about whether they've got a problem which needs remediating or not, but also to ensure that the guidance itself is proportionate and risk-based. Um, and uh, the, the lender's approach to that guidance will be as material as the guidance itself in terms of what the impact will be on freeholders and leaseholders. But um, what they've described so far is a significant shift in the way that they can approach lending decisions. And of course, the impact of the £50 cap and of the increased grant funding for 18 metres plus allows lenders to price the cost of finding an issue that needs remediation, notwithstanding how they go about establishing whether something needs fixing, and therefore putting certainty back into the market and being able to price the impairment on an asset or the impact on somebody's affordability. So what I'm really saying is it provides that the, the remediation funding approach also provides certainty, notwithstanding the fact that we are also issuing uh, or working with RICS and others to issue clearer guidance, which is proportionate and risk-based. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much, Mary. Moving on now to the details of the £3.5 billion fund that was announced, Ian Byrne. Thanks, Chair. Minister, the fund requires that where there are both cladding and non-cladding issues, funds need to be in place for the non-cladding works before any building safety fund money will be dispersed for cladding issues. 
What happens where leaseholders do not have the money to pay for the non-cladding works? Well, I think there's some confusion about this because um, essentially um, the, 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 the works um, can be scoped, obviously, um, uh, to be something that's entirely funded by a grant. So if you focus on um, the remediation of the cladding system, which I said was, and, and everything that's integral to the cladding system, that's funded by grant. And therefore, there shouldn't be any issue. It, but if um, a building owner chooses to scope beyond that to something that um, with associated works, then clearly that 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 we do need to ensure that the um, that funding is in place. But that's a matter for the building owner. Um, what we're what we're what we're saying is that uh, we can't be asked to cover the cost of something that is not who's outside which is outside the scope of the of the fund. So um, you you can um, you can scope. Um, you can you can scope it in a way that avoids that 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 problem. But perhaps um, Richard, you could come in within with with any any other points on that. Happy to, Minister. I mean, I think this might be a helpful reference back to the question that Mr. Blackman was asking earlier about what's included in the fund or not. So let's take balconies, for instance, where those are integral to the external wall, uh, to the external padding system. Then those would be caught within the scope of the fund and we would pay for them. Where they're not integral to the cladding system, but for example, these holders may want to include the work on that in order to do it in one shot. So you're not, you know, redoing effectively, uh, you know, intrusive work in a building several times over. Um, what the fund does is ensure that before we commit to that, because for example, the project management will be done um, uh, by the same people, the procurement approach, you know, the work that would be caught in the tender would be the same, the resident engagement process would overlap between those two things, that we have assurance that that work can be funded um, before committing to that so that the taxpayer doesn't end up with a liability um, for work which is not within the scope of funds which Parliament um, uh, 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 voted for that purpose. No, so, sorry, sorry, not sorry, Richard, I'm talking about leaseholders, not taxpayers. So the question is, what happens when leaseholders do not have the money to pay for the non-cladding works? I haven't got that from you or the Minister. That's the question. What's the answer? So, so, yeah, Richard. Sorry, uh, Mr. Um, what I'm describing is that it, I, if I understood your uh, question correctly, which I might not have done, you were asking about the points, um, uh, the way in which the building safety fund operates for funding. Yeah. Uh, and I'm saying that that scope is aligned to the existing building safety funds. We do ask for confirmation where leaseholders elect to take on other work uh, in addition to what's funded by the building safety funds uh, to confirm that they are in a position to be able to pay for that before we start because we wrap the overall work up into one package. Um, and so if we didn't do that, it would mean the taxpayer would pick up the liability for that if there weren't the funds in place. What it doesn't require is leaseholders to elect to do any work other than what's in scope. So uh, if, for example, leaseholders only want to do the work which is paid for in full by the grant funding, there is no obligation for them to take on other work or to stump up for other work in relation to that as a, as a consequence of applying to the Building Safety Fund. Well, the UK CAG say that by this clause, you're holding the innocent victims of the building safety crisis to ransom and excluding eligible buildings from the fund. So what is the purpose of the clause? Is it as, as Rich is outlining to save the taxpayer money? I'm all, I'm all ears, Minister. I think the the answer, well, the, the direct answer in, the, in this case is the clause is there, um, should the um, leaseholders uh, elect to increase the scope um, to go beyond the remediation of the planning system. And that is a matter for them to decide. But so is it, so isn't the scope been, minister been, about making how it, making the building safe? Is this what we're well, talking about? Again, um, uh, I, you know, it's quite clear that when you, when you put um, public money to something, you have to um, be clear about its remit. It has to be dispersed for that purpose. And this is to ensure that it, it is put to, that, to work on the thing that it's designed to do. And, and uh, as uh, my official just said to you in, in response to you, it is for, for leaseholders to elect to widen it, in which case they would be responsible for those costs that are not integral to the cladding system. That is the, that is the basis upon which the, the um, you know, Parliament and, uh, and this government has made the funding available, and it's to stick to those rules. So we set the remit too narrow. Well, I, the remit is there. Uh, we're going back to scope then. Um, the scope has been designed to focus on the areas of greatest life safety risk, which is 
um, the cladding system that accelerates the spread of fire. Um, and what um, my fish has also said is it does cover those elements uh, such as cavity barriers and balconies that are integral to, um, that, to remediation of that cladding system. Beyond that, it's a matter for leaseholders to decide if they want to expand the, the, the scope or not. Um, they're not being forced to. It's an opt-in. They're not, they're not being compelled to do that, though. I, well, I move on because, uh, as I say, there's, there's lots of grey areas as we outlined by the previous nine questions. Uh, so, Minister, will the money raised through the levy and the new tax be additional to the fund and therefore contribute to building safety or are the Treasury demanding that any monies raised through those routes are offset against the 3.5 billion? Well, at the moment, um, the details of the, as we've said, I think in all the previous questions, the details around this um, ha have not been finalised, but my understanding is that um, you know uh, the, the money will get be, be you know be uh, seeking to contribute towards the the, the, the costs that we've put um, to, to, to 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 pay for the cladding remediation. So it's not necessarily uh, going to be extra. Um, but what I did say in response to the chair's remarks that where we're running out of money and where there may not be enough money, um, it, there may be some flexibility. But all of that is a matter of negotiation in um, between um, uh, MHCLG and Treasury. OK, and lastly, uh, the Secretary of State has said he is following a safety-led approach with funding, focusing on the higher-rise buildings. It is increasingly accepted that height alone is an insufficient criteria for safety. Do you think there should be a more advanced understanding and assessment of risk that underpins funding as opposed to first-come, first-served, which is unfair? Well, um, I think the Secretary of State um, is right that we would want to see um, and certainly I expected to see, I'm the son of a surgeon, and um, surgeons are used to risk-based approach to save lives and that you focus on uh, the things that um, really matter. Um, but, the, but the reality is um, that um, there hasn't been uh, a sophisticated risk, ability to stratify risk in place up to now. The good news is that um, the um, experts, the fire engineers, the people experts in fire safety are developing uh, that approach. Um, though it's, it's known as a PAS or publicly available standard. Um, in several months time, they'll be able to start the process of consultation. And we will be able to take a, uh, an approach that categorizes buildings in terms of being high, medium and low risk. Um, it's also fair to say that we are, um, we're conscious that the wider built environment, we need to take a risk based approach. And that's why we put in around 30 million pounds um, for fire and rescue services to carry out a building risk review um, that's looking at um, at you know the, the risk profile of uh, of, uh, of all buildings um, uh, you know across the country, um, uh, the, the, all high rise buildings across the country, not those that potentially have unsafe cladding, because there are other factors that may be uh, may increase risk. Okay, all right. Thanks, Minister. Thanks, Chair. Uh, thanks, Ian. Uh, Mr. Just a Clarify, if a building therefore has got unsafe cladding and also unsafe insulation, the fund will pay for the removal of the insulation as well? Well, my understanding is where uh, something is integral to the cladding system. Um, so that could be, if the insulation is integral to the cladding system, it would be covered. I, you know, but, so uh, um, I think that's the, yeah, that's the that, answer. That, that's consistent. That, that, is the, uh, that, that, that is the test. I mean, but we've... The, the building safety perspective sets this out in some detail. We have to write uh, to the committee if that's helpful. But but Lord Greenhouse is correct that that it, integral is is the word. Uh, it's tied to the cladding system, but that often involves work on insulation or cavity barriers or uh, soffits and fixtures. But insulation needn't be integrated into the cladding, need it? You can actually have two. You can have insulation and cladding, which are not they're integrated. In which case, it won't be paid for. Is that right? That's that's correct. Yeah, I think that's going to be some interesting anomalies uh, that are, uh, are thrown up when, when practical examples are looked at. Anyway, I'm sure. Uh, sorry, Joe. Just wanted to say um, that is, of course, based on the experience of the existing building safety fund, where we've taken applications, right. uh, where we've taken applications through, rather than a, rather than a novel uh, way yeah. of approaching. But realistically, you you wouldn't uh, put the scaffolding up, would you, to take uh, unsafe cladding off, and then. Uh, not take unsafe insulation off, but then we're back to the problems, aren't we? About if the leaseholders can't afford to pay for that because it's not covered because it's not integral. Um, that's the problem, isn't it? 
Well, I, I, you've, got, you've got the answer to the question about how we're um, how we're applying a considerable amount of grant um, and and the determinant about whether it is or isn't covered. It's set out in the prospectus. Yeah, uh, I, there will be some anomal anomalies. Of course, there will be. Um, but there's a finite sum of money that we're, you know that we've we've got towards solving a very considerable problem. Okay, we may return to to that point, but at least it's I think explained it a little better. Okay, thank you for that. Right, moving on to the impacts on social housing, Bob Blackman. Yes, uh, thank you, Clive, and uh, thank you, Minister. Uh, when when the announcement was made, um, literally in the budget uh, last year, last last spring, um, the Chancellor said that uh, the scheme would ensure that all unsafe combustible cladding will be removed from every private and social residential building above 18 metres high. It's fine. But the building safety fund that was set up uh, restricted the funding to social housing providers unless, and I quote, remediation costs threaten the financial, financial ability or viability of the provider. Can we just be clear why social housing providers were excluded in this particular way? Well, because we recognise where um, that they would have a duty to remediate and then not pass on the cost to leaseholders where they where they would have the financial heft to be able to step up and do what we're asking developers in many cases to do. As you remember, private developers in over 50% of the cases um, stepped forward and uh, stumped up the costs of remediation themselves without passing that on or requiring grants. And equally, we want you know G15 members that have very healthy balance sheets to step forward uh, and remediate the buildings that they're responsible for in the same way we ask uh, for private building owners to to, to to do but where that's where that where they are facing problems uh, and equally councils that might fall into an yeah. hra deficit we will step in and 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 the and and all of these um, uh, funding um, avenues are open to them in that case so how's the assessment being made on financial viability well at the moment it's by application so you know we are seeing a number of uh, social sec social landlords apply to the building safety fund um, for various different reasons, and um, and uh, you know those are being being assessed on the parameters in, set out in the prospectus, um, as outlined. Well, when, when the LGA and National Housing Federation gave evidence to us, yeah. they said that if they're forced to pay for remediation works, then they'll reduce the other maintenance works and cut back on building social housing. I mean, that that seems to be the outcome that's uh, that's happening. Well. I mean, like everybody, uh, we, I, I can't hide behind the fact that this is, and I, you know, neither does the Secretary of State, hide behind the, the fact that this will be difficult for uh, those businesses. They'll have choices to make around their commitment to, um, to deal with all kinds of uh, challenges, the zero carbon challenge that um, my, my official is also responsible for is, alongside building safety, the, the ability to build more housing. It has to be said that we've put, I think it's 12 billion pounds towards uh, the building of more affordable housing available. Um, that's the grant funding that, uh, that social land landlords can, can access to, to build new um, uh, social and affordable housing. Um, and, but it, you know, it's tough, but equally, the reason why we've agreed the terms as, as such is we don't want that to fall on leaseholders in, because they happen to be in a, in, a, in a social block as opposed to a private block. So we wanted the same protections, if you like, for, for leaseholders, and that's the consistency that um, we're able to provide with a scheme um, that does protect them from um, having those costs passed on by, by, by RSLs or councils. But, but obviously one of the issues here is that um, tenants um, or, or leaseholders may end up either getting a reduced service or potentially being charged extra money. Um, well, I think, I think, I mean, you, 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 you and I have both been in councils and understand the public sector well enough that they're unlike business, they pretty, much separate capital projects like this from ongoing revenue. Um, you know, they'll have a, a capital and a revenue uh, a way of accounting for funds. I mean, I can I can imagine um, that the the biggest risk is around uh, you know capital investment in new build is probably the biggest single risk. Um, uh, but equally, you know, if you're going to put scaffolding up a building, if you're going to remove an external wall system, it, it does actually give you opportunities for greater synergies around the zero carbon agenda. And I think that's an area that could be, you know, uh, one of the potential gains is that, you know, you don't, we all know that it's the wrong, you get very irritated, you put the scaffolding up the side of property, yeah. you um, fix one problem and then discover that six months later, you need the scaffolding up again. 
So you know, there are opportunities for, for synergies when they undertake particular capital works. And I think that it's the capital side that is probably slightly more problematic than we're suddenly going to see deteriorating services to their um, social tenants and leaseholders. Okay, all right, thank you. Uh, well, miss, is that, is that totally true? Because uh, capital will be used for new build, and I think that's clearly a worry that uh, you know, we'll see fewer social housing uh, houses built in the future by councils and housing associations. Um, but also, it's often used for uh, restoration and refurbishment uh, of social housing. Uh, you know, the capital reserves will be used to fund, you know, replacement upgrade of the decent homes program. But I wasn't denying so, that. I was saying, Chair, yeah, that the cap yeah. a capital program can be to, can be designed to remediate, but also yes, it, it can. to carry out that in refurbishment and improvement. That was the point I was making. But right. it was capital as opposed to revenue, because I think the point that. Um, uh, that, that, that Bob Blackman was making was that would this result in reduced service levels to to tenants? Well, and I thought so. That was okay. less of the risk, and it was more the impact on the capital program that would be. Where right, the yeah, but a reduced service to tenants could well be not getting their kitchen and their bathroom, their central heating upgraded, which are all capital uh, spending. Uh, and is yeah. it fair that in the same block, a leaseholder who's bought their property off the council? is going to be uh, supported by the government and the work on their property effectively funded by the government. But next door, the tenant will see uh, their possibility of a, a new kitchen, new bathroom, central heating taken away. The tenant is being discriminated against uh, compared with the leaseholder, aren't they? I think, I think actually the reverse is true in terms of discrimination. It would be discriminatory if a block was being remediated and the social tenant did not have to make a contribution and the leaseholder would have to make a real contribution towards the work. What's that? What it's ensuring is all the residents in that building um, have a situation where uh, the remediation is carried out without being passed on to them. And that's well, the, what we're seeking to achieve. Well, uh, passing on doesn't necessarily mean increasing rents. It can mean taking away future benefits, future improvements, such as the kitchen, the bathroom, the central heating, well, because the capital won't be available because there, it, there has to be some impact on t on making social landlords pay for this cost they have to stop doing something else don't they and well, i don't know whether the government the government's done an impact assessment on what that stopping doing something else actually means well i think again uh i think what we're seeking to achieve is the invidious situation where one resident of the building is forced to pay for something and another and another group are not and that's what this uh, but I equally can... but equally i take your point that it would it is going to be tough for um a, a social landlord or a council to prioritize what they need to do when they've also got these um remediation costs but it's something that faces everybody with this crisis and and the five billion pounds is being accessed by many um registered social landlords um where they otherwise would be passing those costs on to leaseholders and that i think is a, a sensible and, and 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 the right approach I understand not passing costs on to leaseholders, and I think the committee absolutely shares that objective. It's not passing them on to leaseholders, but in the same block, uh, actually uh, taking away from tenants uh, possible future benefits because the money is going to have to be spent on cladding removal. Well, I mean, even in your, the way you stated it, that's a hypothetical, but we've got to work through well, and ensure that that, that well, hypothetical doesn't come to pass. But, you know, that's, uh, has an impact assessment been done on, uh, on uh, future um, provision of new homes or, or, or uh, extended maintenance by social landlords as a result of having to bear cladding removal costs? Um, Richard, uh, do you want to come in on the impact assessment for social landlords? Uh, so we've obviously not published an impact assessment on uh, the particular impact of social landlords. That's partially because individual social landlords will make their own choices about what they uh, need to remediate. I, I think it is worth saying that we um, are holding uh, social landlords to the same standard we've asked uh, freehold landlords to, to work to, which is that the, their first priority should be safety any landlord's first priority should be uh, safety to work on that remediation uh, first. Uh, obviously, the, the extent of the total capital outlay for social landlords, for instance, will vary according to the particular surveys um, uh, of their building. Okay. Right, Minister. Uh, I, uh, thank you very much for answering all our questions today, uh, 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 as usual. In an hour and uh, nearly two hours. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, but, um, you uh, know. yeah, it's clearly a very important <laughs> issue to many people. I just wonder whether you wake up in the morning, scratch your head and wonder how, having ma announced a three and a half billion pound extra spending package, you managed to get so many criticism for doing so. Well, um, 
uh, I think you, you, you're, you're asking me to make a comment. Look, I, recognize, <laughs> right. I, I recognize that um, this is really tough for leaseholders. And, but it's also uh, you know, a situation where it's a crisis that I think you'll accept has, has built up over decades. Oh, yes. And it's one of those, yes. it's one of those yes. things that um, you know, it's very hard to get right. Mm -hmm. There are no simple solutions. Mm -hmm. um, we are doing our best mm -hmm. and it is a sizable increase. Mm -hmm. And I think it is appreciated um, that it's um, a significant step. And I know that the campaigners, those people affected, the leaseholders are still affected by costs that aren't covered yeah. are campaigning for more. But they, I should pay tribute to their their yeah. their energy and their efforts because it has meant, you know, that yeah. there's a, a significant amount of additional money has been committed by this government towards um, covering those costs. Okay. And we like to think as a select committee, we perhaps have, 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 have pushed along in the same direction and maybe we have some more pushing to do in the future uh, because it's certainly gone on for decades, Minister. Let's hope it doesn't continue for more decades uh, to come. But uh, well, thank you. not my last appearance and I do <laughs> pay tribute. I know that you uh, to, to, the, to the work. Also, I have to say the excellent um, pre-legislative scrutiny that you've done of the Building Safety Bill, which we'll be responding to shortly. And I appreciate the work that you, this committee's done. And I'm sure this won't be the last appearance, unless I'm no longer a minister, of course. That is the other. But, um, oh. but you know, the, the third won't necessarily be my last. Let's put it that okay. way. OK, we, 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 we probably will look forward to seeing you again, Minister. <laughs> OK, and thank you very much for, for, for coming today and answering our questions. And thank you to Mr Goodman as well.